Bowery, uh, we've since seen just phenomenal record, record sales, 40 million uh, albums sold globally, the hits, Denis, One Way or Another, Rapture, Maria, goes on and on. Uh, but you, I feel, are the man who puts the tiger in the tank of the band. <laughs> Well, you have a very, very energetic, distinctive, and uh, dynamic style, with just performance-wise, and also with your musicianship. Well, it's a bit like being a gunslinger, you know, when you're young, you know, fastest gun in town. And uh, you know, I was, I was definitely out to make a name for myself, you know, and uh, playing drums, you know, you're kind of in the back. So, I was inspired quite a bit by Ringo Starr, Keith Moon. And, People in bands where each individual was uh, had their own sort of persona and was recognized as a contributor. I never really subscribed to the drummer being in the back, you know, and all that. So, actually, now I'm on the side, so I'm not. I'm promoting. <laughs> so, like gradually, every year we can see the drum kit just coming closer and closer to the stage. I gotta say, my favorite time is we did Dreaming on Top of the Pops, and uh, actually the director decided to put me in the front of the band, and that that, that was my like, glory for sure. If you see that on YouTube? I'm like in the front. And yeah, that's great. That's good. Yeah. Maybe you didn't really think you didn't think it through enough when you started as a drummer. You should pick perhaps a different instrument, or maybe even the lead singer. Then you wouldn't have had that that conflict. Well, actually, Dave Clark, Dave Clark Five, uh, yeah. was a big inspiration. Say no more. The band's named after the drummer. Right, right. But anyway, I, I'm really happy that I met uh, Debbie and Chris. You know, back when I did when I was 18 years old, and uh, well, you've been already playing for years and years. Oh yeah, sure. Time, like what, like four years or something? Uh, I probably started playing when I was 10, when I saw yeah. the Beatles on Ed Sullivan back when. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's why I really like that. Those kids now, the Stripes, they're amazing. You know, they're 16 years old and they're out there doing it and they're, they're really doing it well. Yeah, so well. Very inspiring. If you I haven't mean, seen them, they're worth seeing. They're really, really good. And you, uh, but you were playing professionally, what, since you were teenagers, is that right? Like you were in the Jersey scene and... Well, I had... Uh, in New York scene, lower Manhattan. Yeah, it was a social... Thing for me, really, when I started, a way to meet girls and you know hang out with people. And yeah. I was never really into sport, particularly when I was a kid. I was kind of like an outcast in high school, and always about the music. And uh, I had some family issues when I was a kid, with my, my mom being ill and all that. So yeah. I kind of retreated into music, I think, a lot. And, so it was like an outlet. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably be a serial killer if I didn't play the drums. <laughs> <laughs> say, you know, when I was a kid, uh, high school in the States, you know, like, I think they call it something different here. What's high school called here? Something Secondary, different. Modern. Secondary modern. Secondary modern. That's a much better name. <laughs> anyway, high school, which we all were high in high school, for sure. Um, nobody laughs at that. <laughs> all right. Um, I had a band for my freshman and sophomore year in high school. I had one band, and then... Junior and senior high school I had another band. My band, when I was 14 years old, we were in a band competition on WABC radio called Cousin Brucey's Big Break, who's a legendary DJ in the New York area. He's on Sirius Radio now on the 60s channel, if anybody wants to check him out, Cousin Brucey. And uh, he had this thing called Cousin Brucey's Big Break, and you went in, you'd send in a tape of your band, and if uh, they would... If they liked the tape, they would put you in the studio. It was the first time I was in the studio at ABC Studios on 6th Avenue and 55th Street, which, by the way, now is called Cousin Brucey Way. And uh, went in and recorded a song with my high school band, and uh, we were chosen to be in the uh, eliminations, which were normally were in a convention center or in a hotel ballroom, but that particular year it was at Carnegie Hall. So I kind of started at the top and went down from there. You know, I played Carnegie Hall when I was 14. But I always uh, had the aspiration to uh, be successful, uh, to be more, I guess, to be a pop star, a rock star, more so than a serious musician. So I guess I got my wish. And you started at a really exciting time in, in music because there was this whole petri dish of glam rock. Pardon and, me? And, and, <laughs> <laughs> petri dish. It's like, it's like you guys were individually with the jerk. What's a petri dish? Experiment. It's not some strange British it, vernacular. Or it is it, not a British laboratory. vernacular, but it is to what do is it? a laboratory. culture of... Culture. A, little, a what? Where they grow germs. Where they grow germs. <laughs> oh, that's that's been, <laughs> Test tube babies. In the laboratory. Test tube babies. That's right. So basically there was a 
lot of cross pollination going on, and there were, and you know everybody. Wait a minute, you calling me a flower? <laughs> I'm calling you the bee, baby. That's fighting words where I come from. <laughs> and you, so you were coming up at a time where the the scene was trying to kind of redefine itself because first you had that whole burst in in New York of uh, Max's Kansas City and Velvet Underground, and then as far as I understand, all the rock clubs kind of disappeared, and then there, all there was were sort of cabarets, and there wasn't really a place to play. Well, interesting you should bring that up, because I've been working on my book, <laughs> and I have to have a little story about that, if I can read briefly at this juncture Wait, of time. Wait, can, can we just stop before we go into that? You're well, right, I, we need to establish that you are a writer as well. No, I, well, of sorts, I suppose. If you live, you write, I suppose. Don't you? Yeah. And so you've been writing as you've been traveling on the road? Uh, no, it's just little anecdotal things, and I have one about the sort of genesis of the band. Perfect. Find it. You know, I'll read it briefly. Which, yeah. But read it with feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Is that feeling enough? <laughs> okay. Jeez, uh, I should have had this in order. Go ahead, carry on. You can keep playing. Okay. Uh, All right, here we go. So, uh, you were talking about your early influences, Keith Moon, uh, Ringo Starr, uh, Dave Clark, obviously, because he got to name the band after himself and uh, be in the front. He play on the, on the tracks, but... Oh, he wasn't even a real drummer, so we're going to just stand aside with that. Oh, jeez, am I missing my one that I really want? I'm surprised you haven't committed... Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm good now. But... Okay, bring it in the mic. Yeah, of course, I know the mic, yeah. I have spoken into a microphone before. <laughs> you can't be too sure of these people. <laughs> okay, uh, this one's called Early Days. I was an 18-year-old boy fresh out of high school, making a trip to New York City from a working-class New Jersey suburb in search of the last gaps of the dinosaur that had become rock and roll. I came to look for it, I had come to look for it on the mean streets of the Lower East Side, New York City, circa 1973. I began my search at one place in particular, the Club 82, East 4th Street. The place was run by a bunch of hardcore lesbians who all dressed as though they were supporting cast of Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> DA haircuts, white t-shirts with a pack of camel cigarettes rolled up in their sleeve cuffed. Cuffed Levi's and maybe a black leather biker jacket. Most of the week featured entertainment, most of the, most of the week the featured entertainment was a drag show. Female impersonators were then followed by a gay disco that lasted well into the morning. But Wednesday nights were special. It seemed someone, I still don't know who, had convinced Tommy, the James Dean lookalike, to have rock and roll bands one night a week. So there I was on my way to see my heroes, the New York Dolls. After paying my cover to Tommy at the entrance, I descended the stairs into a world that was unknown to most of New York City, let alone the rest of the world. It was a nocturnal world inhabited by New York City's emerging underground rockers. It was there that I first encountered a strange group called Stilettos, which included my future partners in rock and roll history, Debbie Harry and Chris Stein. The group also featured television bassist Fred Smith, who would quit one of the in-between our debut sets at CBGB's in early 1975. My ambition at that point was to have my band, Sweet Revenge, play on a Wednesday night at the club. A few months later, we did get to play there, and it was the band that I would leave in early 74 to begin my journey with my fellow members of Blondie. Ta-da! So, uh, Club 82, uh, Club 82 was the, uh, was the sort of uh, jumping off point. The it was Petri like Rock Club. <laughs> I'm still, I gotta, I gotta Google that. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, Club, Club 82. 82 was where it was all, that was where the people that you wanted to be in with were. Yeah, that. Johnny Thunders would be past them on the steps and, you know, uh, that, that legendary gig that they did on Halloween in the New York Dolls when they all uh, dressed in drag, except for Johnny Thomas who refused to dress in drag, he dressed as a Nazi instead. <laughs> and uh, that's when I saw the, the stilettos with Chris and Debbie where I met them initially. And coincidentally, it's, uh, 82 East Fort Street was basically uh, directly around the corner from 313 Bowery, which was the uh, home of CBGB. So everyone basically kind of cut their hair and, and lost the platform shoes and moved over to uh, the Bowery. And how did you first get folded into Blondie? You saw a, an ad in the Village Voice? Folded in, like a recipe? Maybe? Yeah, look, well, gently, <laughs> gently and tenderly. Yeah, well, um, pre-internet, uh, there was uh, 
back to the village voice, musicians wanted, or musicians unwanted, however you may look at it. And uh, yeah, there was an ad in there, but I already had, had sussed out that the ad that was, uh, by, uh, was uh, written by uh, those two, my friends. Oh, you are and uh, I knew that, I was prepared, and I, I, when I showed up for the audition, I had seen a picture of, uh, saw a picture of uh, Keith Moon in a sailor, sailor shirt, and uh, I, I wore the sailor shirt, and I had these red shoes on. And Chris Stein always says, uh, they liked my shoes, that's why they chose me, but <laughs> apparently there was, a, uh, there was a shopping list of drummers that came prior to me, and it wasn't really an audition, we, we kind of talked about the Ronettes and Iggy Pop, and that was about it. And, then I broke my maid, and uh, as, as I said in that piece, uh, Fred Smith went on to uh, join uh, the band Television, and I broke my maid in uh, a guy called Gary Valentine, who actually lives in London, is a writer who writes mostly about uh, Poultry Guys and uh, Alistair Crawley and things like that nowadays. He's got three or four or five books out on that subject. But he also wrote a book called New York Rocker. And he and I lived in a, a, a storefront on the Lower East Side, along with two other people. And, uh, and can you talk a little bit about what it was like in the Lower East Side in those days? Because this was a, a city on the verge of bankruptcy around 74, 75. And the, the sanitation workers had gone on strike, so there was garbage in the streets, and firemen were going on strike, police were riding. I mean, what was it like to be young and uh, hungry and creative? Well, it was easy to lose weight because no one had any money, so. <laughs> and, uh, so we didn't have any money for food, basically. And, um, you know, it was a very opportune time for everyone because of the uh, economic situation. I mean, my first apartment on uh, in the West Village was sixty dollars, hundred twenty dollars a month, and I was paying twice what the previous tenant had paid, sixty dollars a month. So it's somewhat different now. Um, you know, basically there was a line, uh, like was the DMZ line would be you wouldn't go beyond First Avenue. When I met Chris, uh, he was renting out his apartment on First and First Avenue to. Uh, Tommy Ramon was living there and when he moved in with Debbie on Google Street. And uh, basically, the, the Alphabet City, as it was called, was just a, a drug haven, you know, crack, not crack, that's modern drug, I guess, heroin and things like that. And uh, you really didn't go beyond uh, First Avenue. And so it was that whole, from the East River, from Avenue A to East River, was like you really wouldn't go there at all. Now that's like, you know, prime real estate as the rest of Manhattan as well. And, uh, you know, uh, things, basically, the, the, the pretty things had the song Midnight to Six, and that was basically my existence. It's about, you know, getting up at midnight and staying out till six in the morning. And you always made sure when you went out at night you had your sunglasses, because you know more than likely to see the sun coming up. And, you know, the gigs didn't start till like midnight. Nothing happened till, it's not like nowadays in Manhattan. There's gigs like after office hours, you know, or, I was always amazed by the that, that uh, the Beatles playing the lunchtime things. I'm like, what, who's playing rock and roll at lunchtime? You know, I'm asleep. You know, but um, so nothing really started until midnight. So you would stay out most the entire night. I mean, the bars stay open until four. CBGBs would, you know, they'd lock the door. And there'd be a handful of people there. You know, Joey Ramon, Didi Ramon, Johnny Ramon, Arturo Vega, who just passed, the Ramon's designer. Rest in peace. And, uh, you know, there'd be, you know, Johnny Thunders, and it was like a club, it was about a hundred people, like, I mean, it was a club, but I mean, it was like a sort of an crowd thing, Chris and Debbie, myself, uh, maybe one or two women, Nancy Spongin, and uh, maybe Sable Star. But and there weren't that many female performers, it was Patti Smith. There weren't many females, period, really, it was really a brave new world for Debbie and Patti to, yeah. to, to explore, really. Yeah, the, that's when things started moving along, when you can see the crowd becoming more sort of integrated at CBG. We're actually women showing up, or people from other parts of the, you know, and it the suburbs. It wasn't the same old faces. And then right. how must have it felt uh, for you just starting with this new band, Blondie, it's your first gig, and Fred Smith announces in the middle of your set that he's leaving the band. I mean, it's crumbling even as you're joining. What was that like? Well, I just remember thinking that I wanted to persevere and that I had found some folks that I uh, wanted to continue working with, which were uh, Chris and Debbie. So I, uh, I, I encouraged them quite a bit, and I, I think it's, it's been documented either here or there that I kind of pushed things forward a little bit. I got Gary, as I said, my mate from school in the band. He was like 18 years old, never played the bass before. 
he sat down, at uh, his audition, he just sat down and read a couple of his poems and uh, <laughs> banged on the piano. And then we actually jammed on the stones, live with me. So uh, basically, that, those elements were there. He and I were, you know, he was like maybe 18, I was 19 by that time. And the two of them were a bit older, and uh, that was kind of the nucleus of the band. And, uh, Does it seem like that uh, a large part of... I mean, I was convinced that I wanted to keep going with, with, with Chris and Debbie. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you really... There was no bags support. of money involved or anything like yeah. that, for sure, you know. It does seem though that the musicianship wasn't, I mean, wasn't the name of the game because this was a brand new world, as you say, and it was more about the shared influences and kind of the philosophy. That, that's what I'm getting. From yeah, well, there's an aesthetic that we had that, that still kind of holds true to this day, and it's amazing to see how much of that has a sort of impacted popular culture, I think, not to blow my own horn, but I mean, Debbie obviously is very... I don't know what you would call it. So I was reading the thing about the 70s, and they said they didn't have icons in the 70s, they just had well-known people or something. But <laughs> now everybody's sort of a fucking icon. My boots are a fucking <laughs> Marlon Brando wore these in a while, you know. It's an iconic boot. It's fantastic. Anyway. Can your feet live up to the iconicness of those boots? Oh, absolutely. I've been wearing these since I was 16 years old. I mean, I, in school, I used to wear a motorcycle jacket and motorcycle boots. And, Basically got thrown out every other day. And, uh, <laughs> threw my books in the garbage can, and I had the teacher like that. What's that song? Uh, uh, Violent Femmes had that song. This will go down on your permanent record. <laughs> and, like, I had an English teacher like that. And God knows how I got to college. I have no idea in my any way how I got from high school to college. None. It's just a blur. So there was um, a shaky period for Blondie to begin with because there was a lot of personnel shifting. I mean, even before you came on board, and uh, you got busted by Debbie because you were you were auditioning for Patti Smith. Oh yeah, that was that was funny. Yeah. I mean, I was convinced that that Patti Smith was you know the second coming, which she is brilliant. But to my great fortune, uh, it's very good that I didn't uh, get that gig, you know, because um, obviously things are, would have been a little different, you know. I mean, she's a fantastic artist, but she hasn't had the commercial success that we've had with, with Blondie and the rewards that come with that. So I'm very uh, happy about that. But I think what happened was she asked me who my favorite drummer was. I think at the time I said John Bonham, which was the wrong answer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but we were up in the, in the Blondie loft on uh, West 30th Street. And Lenny Kay and Patty and myself were in there jamming, and, and Gary was hanging out with me. And we, the two of us walked, not that, they must have walked in because I, I had the keys to, to our loft. And um, she walked in and said, You know, which one's the drummer? I said, You know, I'm the drummer. And she looked at Gary, what, he had sunglasses. She said, What do you play, sunglasses? You know, because he had sunglasses. <laughs> and uh, I think we smoked some hash and uh, started the jam, and then all of a sudden uh, the door opens, and Debbie and Chris walked in. I'm in there, like, banging on the drums with Patty. And, uh, Anyway, that, that's kind of gotten misinterpreted. Uh, you know, like the reason I got in Blondie was because I got turned down from Patty. But the reason I guess I persevered in Blondie was I got turned down from Patty. But either way, <laughs> she's an amazing artist. And uh, you know, when Bob Dylan came to see her at uh, on Bleecker Street at the uh, geez, why can't I think of the name of that club? Anyway, that that's was what, all. Happened. No, Bitter End. No, Bitter, End. Bitter End, actually. Okay. And uh, you know, that was all happening at that period. I'm like, wow, this is be great but you know she was a catalyst you know yes. there was an energy amongst the the, the, the handful of artists and, and musicians that were around and that's kind of what generated the whole CBGB scene and that's really I attribute that a lot of uh, Blondie's, early Blondie success to the fact that the, the scene that was going on in yeah. New York as it as it progressed you know we're talking about the really genesis of it but as it progressed it moved everyone along you know television Patti Smith the Ramones the Johnny Thunders and Talking Heads Talking Heads Ming yeah. DeVille Things it was like a that. huge cauldron, and you guys didn't necessarily share, oh. That's all right. I'm sorry, sure. did you guys ever see that Beatles in Tokyo? McCartney's like, all of a sudden he's like, just stops and like looks at his watch and goes, oh, we only have time for one more song. <laughs> it's like in front of like 3,000 Japanese screaming fans. It's pretty funny. It's on YouTube. Now, I know, you, I know your uh, sound check isn't for a few hours, so. Uh, so, <laughs> could you play tonight? Yeah, we're playing at the Roundhouse tonight, yeah. And you play, and you just got in 5 o'clock this morning, so... I'll be Forrest, yeah. It was really funny, I was I was telling uh, my friend Marcus Smith, who's here, who has the Klemberg drumming project with me, and Katie, uh, last night at the end. You guys weren't, how come you guys weren't in Liverpool last night? How dare you? You live in Liverpool. <laughs> we're here today. We came here. So, you'll really get this, so... So, uh, on the encore, Debbie is, is 
first off, she's like telling the crowd up north how excited she is that we're going to be coming to London, right? And now, how that works, right? <laughs> so then secondly, we had had the day off in Manchester, which was brilliant. Went to some great restaurants, went so that we had the stripes, so Miles Kane actually played after them. He was brilliant as well. And uh, so then she moves on to, we had such a great day in Manchester, right? <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I get off the drums and I walk over, I go, Debbie, Liverpool, we're near Liverpool. Because Ian Brody actually has been opening for us with the lighting seats. And they said, you know, oh yeah, we just live down the road. And so a light bulb went on in my head. You know what, uh-oh, that's valuable information there, please. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So then the next thing I could definitely say Liverpool, which she did, and then the crowd erupted, and then we, we did please, please me. So we made amends. Because you don't sit on the, stand on the stage in you know, Liverpool and say how great it is in London. You know, sure. I only know that from you know, the Beatles and all that. I mean, I'm not, You're a natural I'm not like a, I'm not a you know, authority on it, but I kind of had an inkling. Into, it's like going to Queens and championing Brooklyn or something. You know, it's like, it ain't going to work. Yeah, so anyway, it was, it was cool, it was a moment. And, but we've been doing a lot of uh, improvisational things on stage. And I actually look at live performance more like jazz, really. I don't look at it as like a study, like pop music or rock and roll. It's not about perfection. It's not about doing the exact same thing every night. It's certainly not about uh, repetition. It's about energy and the energy you evoke on the night. And, you know, I mean, my heroes are people like Springsteen and, Actually, Jack White's really good at it now. And, you know, you've got to be able to gauge the audience a little bit. And uh, I just saw this wasn't growing right. And, uh, there, <laughs> anyway. It but it's great that I'm in the, that we're, we're getting along so well that I, I had the, uh, the bollocks, or I had whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and it didn't really matter. I just got off the drum and said, we're fucking Liverpool now. <laughs> Focus on the place. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't, that's a hello Cleveland thing when you're in Arkansas, but you know, it's a story. So, in addition to all of the cross-pollination that was going on with all the bands, I and... stayed on my trousers, so... <laughs> Let's get that sorted out. You look flawless. I see no stain, I just see wetness. You haven't seen the inside. Oh. <laughs> That'll be later. Oh. So... That was a dirty comment. I mean, it's hot. I have a filth turret. That's my... Uh, Let's talk too. about that for a minute. So, um, this is a project that you've been doing for the last handful of years? It's been over ten years now, I think. Uh, Two handfuls. Yeah, uh, um, Dr. Marcus Smith from Chichester University uh, came to me, uh, wrote me a letter when we were playing Wembley back in 99. And uh, I'd always been into uh, trying to stay as fit as possible in order to be able to do this as I progress to the ripe old age that I have now. And uh, I was always aware of that. And once getting back to Springsteen again, you know, I mean, he's a real role model for me, the way he lives his life, the way he performs on stage. And so when Marcus brought up the fact that he was making the analogy between drumming and, and fitness, or let's say drumming and boxing, or drumming and sport, I already got fully kind of understood where it was coming from, so I found it interesting to collaborate with him on this project, which, because the band stayed together, we've been together longer now than we were the first time around, and uh, he was able to really kind of develop a thesis on this whole thing, and we do like blood, oxygen, heart rate check. We're going to do it tonight, actually. So it's basically the idea that it's drumming can enhance your life physically, and mentally, emotionally. It's a positive spin, as, yeah. as I said before, you know, God knows what I would be doing if I wasn't uh, drumming. Who's that? Oh, here I am again. Huh? I didn't know this was flashing behind me. But yeah, the, the Glenbrook Drumming Project, if, I'm, uh, if you haven't heard about it, you should just check. It's online. It's, it's, it's an awesome thing. It's a very positive way of uh, And what do you seem to do life. with it? Like, that once they're monitoring you and you have that crazy Darth Vader mask on and everything, um, is, what are they doing with that information? You gotta ask him. <laughs> he actually does. We do seminars. We did several seminars, and uh, I think Marcus just came back from uh, Barcelona to Barcelona, <laughs> and uh, at a, a, a health and fitness seminar, I think it was. And he, he presents his data, and uh, you know, there's other drummers involved. I'm kind of like the figurehead for it now. I'm very happy to, be, to do so. But is that idea that you you know kids who are maybe at a loss or aren't getting exercise or troubled or yeah, whatever, absolutely. have an outlet? It's a, it's a total outlet. Drumming is a yeah. great uh, physical and mental exercise for sure. You know. H have you ever found yourself accidentally on purpose in one of those drum circles at uh, no. festivals? <laughs> is it, that's not your thing. Actually, Golden Gate Park. I hung out and watched one. Yeah. 
I mean, What's I think, your feeling uh, about that? I've been known to bang on a cowbell when I've had a few beers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're a furious cowbell basher. Yeah, right. more cowbell. Yeah, but because the drum circles are sort of that idea, though. Is that like, you know, communal getting off on the beat and also uh, deploying a certain amount of energy? Well, obviously, besides the voice, it was the first instrument, I guess. Yes, you know, yes. Drumming, banging on things. But uh, no, rhythm is a, a great. Uh, you know, it's a great motivator. Yeah. You know, in a lot of ways, and um, so yeah, when it's you, good. so when you guys were um, kind of coming, all coming into your own in like seventy five, seventy six, uh, there was also a little bit of to and fro with the the London scene and the UK scene because you were doing some traveling. Uh, the New York Dolls had gone over there, uh, come over here earlier. Right. And um, so, were you guys getting influenced by what was happening in the punk rock scene? In the UK? Um, well, yeah, as far as um, <clears throat> the energy that was being created, and uh, I had come over here in 75, a, a girlfriend of mine was going to school at the Polytech here, and uh, actually got to see Eddie and the Hot Rods, and uh, I saw a bunch of Dr. Feelgood gigs, and I kind of brought that stuff back to New York, and legend has it that I brought this Dr. Feelgood record back to New York City, and it is true, when I, came, I was in London for about three or four months and I brought the record back and we had the loft by then where we rehearsed and then the, my fellow band members had a party, a welcome home party for me that basically it was like everyone that would be at CBGB, you can imagine, they were all at the party, except maybe for Patty. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we incessantly played the Dr. Feelgood record over and over that night. And that Dr. Feelgood was kind of like, because of the minimalism of it, the style, the dress style, that was a big... Uh, uh, immediate influence, everyone kind of got that right yeah. away. And a uh, brilliant gig at sort of the bottom line in New York was uh, Dr. Feelgood headlining with the Ramones opening. And, uh, you know, Philly's really sad about Wilco Johnson yeah. being so ill now. Yeah. They were, they were, their sort of minimalism and their aesthetic was a big influence on us. So they're, they're sort of pre punk, obviously, the pub rock, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember sitting in Max's Kansas City the first time I heard Anarchy in the UK. I think Wayne County was the DJ he was playing it thinking, that sounds like a song that I've heard before by a band called Fast, but that's another story. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, Fast. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, sure, we were influenced by that energy. And, yeah. I mean, I, actually, we were, uh, Malcolm McLaren actually, we were initially asked to be on that Anarchy tour, which I, I think we were better off that we did that tour, you know, the tour with oh, Clash, and yeah. Clash and Sex Pistols and yeah. The Damned and uh, Johnny, John, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. Remember? But we were asked to, to do that, but well, we, we declined. We were trying to stay away from the sort of punk label in some ways. By that time, we had a manager who kind of discouraged us from the sort of being, you know, it's kind of like Epstein with the Beatles, like, don't be these greaser rock and roll guys, be these kind of pop stars. And not that we were manipulated that way, but it was, it was thought that maybe it'd be better to not align ourselves completely with so-called punk rock. Well, that, you know, that was... Which we weren't really no. in that tradition anyway. We were more so influenced by a whole uh, amalgamation of different types of music, whether, I mean, at Club 82 there was dance music. I always say disco music was just as subversive as punk rock. You know, it started in, in the gay discos, it was an underground music, and I think the, the film Saturday Night Fever is almost like a punk rock movie, if you, if you look at it that way. And they were happening simultaneously, and uh, so we were influenced by, by dance music and things like that as well particularly because it was all that was played at Club 82 prior to, you know, having the rock nights and all. So. That's really interesting. So what kind of dance music would have been played? Like Philly Soul, that kind of you thing? You know, Shame, 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 right. or uh, Rock the Boat. Yeah. Uh, all those, but see, I think like Daft Punk have this record now that everyone's going nuts about it's, because they went back to traditional instruments. They have now Rogers and they're doing yeah. dance disco music. Which I, I think, like, I mean, ABBA was like one of the greatest concerts I ever saw. They, they had a lot of sort of dance type songs. Right. But it was musicians doing it, it wasn't programmed. And now the whole big hoopla about the Def, Def Punk album is because they're it's, using. It's so interesting, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's full it's circle. Yeah, it's like revolutionary because of that. And it, it's kind of analogous to the fact that, to the way that with the punk rock scene here, they would play reggae at the club. So it was all. Right, yeah, that, which wasn't as influential in the States, no. but Chris Stein particularly was a. Uh, and when we did Titus Hine, all that he kind of found yeah. that track, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, when did 
the band start to gel? Because you know you did have sort of fits and starts, and uh, when you were beginning, and then it started to really coalesce.